All right, so Physics 252, welcome back. This is the last lecture for Chapter 25. Uh, we're going to do alternating current <clears throat> and then apply uh, power alternating current. So the basic idea, as you might expect, uh, we have two ways of driving current through a circuit. We either can either um, drive it in one direction. Remember, current is not a, a vector, but it does have a direction. <laughs> uh, we define positive, conventionally positive current flow from the positive terminal around to the negative terminal. So positive current flows um, in the direction of decreasing voltage. In reality, negative current flows in the direction of increasing voltage. Uh, but those two uh, ways of looking at current are identical for most purposes. Um, but so it may make sense that why wouldn't we design current this way, our circuit this way? Like, you know, we've got a battery, it drives current around. As long as the battery's potential, chemical potential energy lasts, the current will flow in one direction, be constant. Uh, in fact, the current will, will be only constant if the resistance is constant, of course. Um, but why would we even uh, have such a thing as alternating current? What's that for? What's it, you, you know, why do we make it? What's it used for? Uh, we'll get into all that. So, but alternating current, obviously, as you might expect, is a current that varies sinusoidally, okay? alternates between positive and negative. Um, the basic, you know, the, the kind of simple answer that we'll look, kind of looking ahead, we'll definitely look very, very deep into this, but the simple answer to why we have alternating current is because that's how we generate current, okay? We don't, of course, generate the electricity for our electrical grid with batteries. We generate it with generators, and the output of a generator is an alternating current. So, we can, of course, uh, use an AC to DC converter to convert from AC to DC whenever we want, but um, we generate power with generators, and the output of a generator is an alternating current. So, um, so the uh, voltage is a function of time. It's sinusoidal, so we just write it as a sine function. V naught is the amplitude. Um, because it's sinusoidal, we can write the argument of the sine function this way as a factor times t, okay? The two pi f, the uh, f stands for frequency, so the number of oscillations per second um, is the frequency. Um, if you convert oscillations to radians per second, um, two pi f is the total number of radians per second, and so we write Radians is omega because that from 251 is uh, an angular velocity, radians per second. Now, again, nothing is actually rotating that we can see. Okay, so this isn't, um, strictly speaking, exactly the same as um, angular velocity that we learned about in physics 251. But surprisingly, there is something rotating, and it's rotating in the system, and it's rotating at exactly the rotational speed omega that's related to exactly the number of oscillations per second of this alternating current. Okay, so we'll get to that as well. But so for convenience and for other reasons, we write uh, the voltage, the time dependent voltage function, as an amplitude times sine of the angular frequency. We still call it that, again, because there is something that is actually turning, even though you can't really see what it is yet. Um, but in that turning, of course, does in fact relate to the turning of the generator, right? So you may, can even talk about, you if you really want to, you can say that the origin of using the this symbol for the angular velocity, omega, in our alternating current voltage and current functions uh, the ultimate origin is the fact that in a generator, the generator is turning, and it in fact is turning at this speed, okay? All right, um, so the turning of the generator determines the uh, frequency of the output, the alternating current output. All right, um, now, so a sine function, didn't, I don't know if we have a, let's see if we have a, uh, Picture. There we go. So you ask, what is the average value? If if current alternates, 
we, you know, and it oscillates pretty fast, right? Uh, the frequency of current coming out of our outlets is 60 hertz, so it alternates 60 times per second. So uh, what we're looking at really when we measure what's the voltage or current coming out of the, the outlet, we're looking at the average values. So wait a second, right? Because we don't, we don't look at time dependent. We can't track that that fast with our eyes or with our, I mean, of course, we could track it with an instrument if we wanted to, but the devices that we plug in function based on the average value. So for that, wait a second, that kind of poses a problem because the average value of a sine function is zero, right? I mean, visually, you can see that if you average this sine function over many cycles, the average is zero. It spends just as much time in positive territory as negative territory. So we've got a problem because clearly <laughs> the average power used by our devices is not zero, right? Uh, the average... Well, I got to sneeze here. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> um, hold on one second. All right, so I just had to blow my nose there. Um, so as I was saying, if the average value of the current function is zero over many cycles, but we clearly know that the average power consumed by our devices is not zero. Like it's not the case that our devices are kind of springs that they're storing energy and then releasing it back into the outlet and storing it and releasing it. No, our devices just constantly use the energy, right? Otherwise the power company would charge us zero for zero average energy used. It doesn't do that. Um, so are we being robbed? What's going on? No. Um, the average power consumed is something that we calculate using something called a root mean squared function. So first of all, power, as we as we described behind me, right, uh, behind me, uh, in our last lecture, power can be represented as I squared times R or V squared over R, it doesn't really matter. So in fact, power is not a directly proportional to current by itself. Power is proportional to the current squared, right? This is power. Now look at this function. Is the average value of this function zero? Clearly not. The average value of a sine squared function is one half, as it turns out. If you average over many cycles of a sine squared function, the average will approach exactly one half. So the average power, if we draw a bar over I squared R, right? I is a time dependent function. The average is one half of the amplitude uh, squared, right? Because this is I squared times R. So the average, again, the average power used is one half times the amplitude squared times R because the average value of the sine squared function, which comes into the comes out of this, is one half. Okay. So um, go back to our lecture. So um average is not zero even for alternating current the, even though the average value of the sine function is zero the average value of the sine function is not zero it's one half so the average power used is calculated this way um therefore if we want to say okay um when we measure current or voltage coming out of our outlet if what we're interested in is something that is connected to the average power being used, then we define something called the root mean squared value, okay? Again, the actual average of voltage and current over many cycles is zero, and that doesn't tell us anything. Since we know where our device is using power, right, I proportional to I squared or V squared, then we square those things and then take the average of the square of those things and then take the square root. Okay, since the average of the square is, involves one half, when we take the square root, we get a one over square root of two. Okay, so when our uh, when we measure things, measure voltages or currents coming out of our outlets with a device called a multimeter, it's not going to tell us the instantaneous time dependent voltage or current because that changes too fast, changes sixty times per second. What it's going to tell us What's going to read us is 
the root mean squared. It's going to say, okay, um, the square of the amplitude of the current or voltage, okay, uh, give, will give us an average value of one half of that amplitude. And then if we take the square root, we get approximately 70.7% .7 of the amplitude, okay? So again, what does that even mean? Why do we do this? It just tells us, it gives us a sense of, um, since we know our device is using power, it gives us a sense of the amplitude. Because you see this I naught in there? Uh, if we average over the power cycle, many power cycles, and then take the square root, we still get a, a measure of a certain percentage of the amplitude. Okay, so in case you didn't know this, when we say 120 volts, like it says in this in these pictures, uh, 120 volts here uh, coming out of the outlet, sometimes it's between 110 and 120 volts, that is not the amplitude. That is the root mean square of the amplitude. Okay, that's the root mean square uh, current or voltage. 120 volts is not the voltage amplitude coming out of our outlet. It's about 170 because of this formula. In fact, you can calculate that. So, um, some basic examples that you can work through, definitely work through those. Um, but that's that's really what we need to know about alternating current. Uh, we'll learn, we'll revisit more when we look at generators, but of course we need to know about magnetism and electromagnetism and electromagnetic induction to figure out what generators are doing. So, uh, basically, this is a good conceptual example. I can talk about this conceptually. Calculate the resistance in the peak current, peak current, not root mean squared, the actual amplitude, uh, in a 1,000 watt hair dryer connected to a 120 volt line. Okay, so uh, power is 1,000. Uh, you can use one of these formulas, right? V squared over R. <coughs> um, so the keeping in mind, keeping in mind that the 120 volts is uh, actually 0.707 of the amplitude, okay? So using those two formulas, you can calculate what the actual amplitude is. Uh, and then using that, cal calculate the peak current. Um, but you can use those two things to calculate the resistance. Knowing the resistance, if you connect it to a 240 volt line, so again, 240 is RMS, but if you connect it to a higher voltage line, okay, um, what's going to happen? For the given, for the same amount of resistance, okay, a higher voltage line, if you look at um, either of these power equations, I squared R or V squared over R, okay, what's going to happen? Well, um, in fact, start up here. Voltage is current times resistance. Start there, okay? Um, if current is therefore then voltage divided by resistance and voltage goes up, current is going to go up, okay? If current goes up, I squared times R, then, of course, uh, for a fixed resistance, power is going to go up which means more power is going to be spent in that device. How is it going to be spent? Through heat. Okay, that's how high hair dryers are supposed to spend their power, through heat. That's their function. So if you dissipate roughly twice as much heat in this device as it was designed to dissipate, it will melt and it will short circuit. Okay, that's bad. All right. Um, we're only going to talk about these, this last section conceptually. Uh, last couple sections, we're going to skip 20, 25, 10, but we're going to look at look at um, this only conceptually. Okay, um, I'm actually going to remove the quantitative problems from the homework in a second uh, involving this because we're just we need to trim things down for the sake of time. So conceptually, right, conductors have all these conduction electrons and they're moving through the material. Um, and we talk, when, we, when we talked about electrostatics, we talked about the movement of electrons happens very fast, called the relaxation time. But if we want to keep a constant flow, constant flow, we have to also imagine that, um, <clears throat> pull up a picture here. 
we have to imagine that what's actually happening is the electrons are trying to move with the electric field. Remember, these are electrons, electric field goes from positive to negative, so electrons are drawn to positive. So they're moving from right to left in this diagram. What's actually happening is as they try to move, they're bumping around, they're bumping their way through the material. Okay? So uh, there's an enormous amount of electrons present. Uh, but the question is, how fast is their actual drift speed because of all this bumping that happens? Because it turns out in most, most room temperature conductors, the drift speed, is, drift speed is on the order of millimeters per second. Okay, a certain number of millimeters per second. Why? Are the electrons actually moving that slowly? No, their movement, their actual net speed, right, path traveled divided by distance, or divided by time, their net speed is incredibly fast, but most of that movement is random zigzag motion in the material because of how much motion is happening, right? Remember, at room temperature, that is a lot of thermal motion. Things are vibrating very, very fast. So electrons that have to move and encounter an enormous amount of collisions, okay? So the question is, Again, how fast do electrons actually move down the wire? Very, very slowly, millimeters per second. But there are so many, and they're all so connected, right, that if you push some electrons on one end of this, co this conductor, that net push will push electrons on the other end of the electron, uh, push electrons on the other end, on the left end, virtually instantaneously. The electric field, in, the, it's in a sense, kind of like links in a chain. You pull on one link, the other chain, end of the chain moves immediately. Why? Because these are all, you know, even molecules in a chain are connected through electrostatic forces. So the, the transference of force down the chain or down the sea of conduction electrons, that happens at the speed of light or very close to the speed of light. But the actual flow, if you were to tag an electron and see and track it, you know, kind of like a scientist studying you know, a fish or a shark in the ocean, uh, its actual motion would, in one direction, would be mostly zigzaggy, and the flow would be very, very small, okay? All right, so we can calculate that. Uh, next concept, in fact, the last concept that we're going to talk about in this chapter is superconductivity. So, um, superconductivity is a very strange phenomenon. It's a phenomenon where uh, as you reach a very, sh as you're cooling it down and you reach a very, very cold temperature called the critical temperature, the resistivity of, of certain materials, certain materials uh, drops to zero. What does that mean? I mean, if we define resistance to be the ratio of voltage to current, what does that mean? <laughs> uh, does that mean, you know, infinite current because voltage over current uh well we don't have truly infinite current <clears throat> uh but we have a lot <laughs> um so if you define resistance as the ratio of voltage to current as resist resistance goes to zero we do indeed get a current that approaches an infinite value okay um for a finite amount of voltage you apply a finite amount of voltage and then virtually all where we're talking about trillions of trillions of electrons um, just flow spontaneously. Okay, the reason why that happens is quantum mechanics. Uh, at some temperature, I should have said actually more accurately, let's not exaggerate, billions of billions, um, billions of billions of electrons uh, all become one thing. It happens quantum mechanically, one wave function. So uh, because they become one thing, they're no longer bumping into each other. They can't. They're one thing. Uh, and that one thing just flows in the direction of the potential difference or, you know, opposite the electric field. So uh, this is a very fascinating phenomenon. Enormous amounts of current, enormous amounts of current can be generated uh, in superconductors. So very valuable, very potentially useful. Uh, the problem is that the material has to be very, very cold. Okay, the original superconductors were measured. This phenomenon was originally observed to happen first at four degrees Kelvin. Okay, 
that is close to negative 270 degrees Celsius, which is close to negative 470 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. Um, so very, very cold, not very useful. Um, there's been a lot of research into finding higher temperature superconductors. Um, and currently we have superconducting materials that can superconduct at close to negative 100, 100 degrees uh, Celsius. <clears throat> so um, again, those are just approximates. But the, the, the idea here is that um, we cannot have material that superconducts at room, room temperature. It's, it's very, very difficult. All right, um, so <clears throat> um, this is a pretty outdated slide. You can, in fact, do a Google search on um, highest temperature, highest TC, critical temperature superconductor. Uh, see what you find, it's kind of fun. All right, um, and then this last section for the bio, people are going into health sciences. Of course, it's very important to understand that uh, nerve signals are are conveyed through action potentials, potential meaning voltage, same kind of thing. It's a potential difference, voltage difference across the membrane that travels down our axons uh, and dendrites, uh, conveyed between cells through the synapses. So uh, very important stuff in the realm of health sciences. I don't really go too deeply into it. Most of my students tend to be, you know, headed towards engineering. Uh, but if you're if you're one of those students, one of those few students that are taking physics because you're doing pre-med or something like that, uh, this is definitely a, the right time to just you know conceptually read over. Don't don't dive too deeply. Don't get too bogged down. But conceptually read over this section so that um, when voltages and potentials are fresh in your mind, you can then uh, connect that to the health sciences that you're going to be learning. So uh, very important stuff. All right, folks, uh, that does it for our Chapter 25 lecture. Uh, as always, let me know if you have any questions. We'll see you in the next lecture.